Good morning, everyone. God bless you on this Sunday morning. On behalf of the New Beginning Church of God Sunday School Department, our pastor, Bishop Leroy Odom, our first lady, Evangelist Willa Odom, and our Sunday School Superintendent, Missionary Sabrina Morgan, we are glad that you decided to join us for another Sunday School lesson. We are in our summer quarter of the Union Gospel Series lessons, and our main theme of study is people of valor. We're talking about people of great courage, who have great courage in the face of danger, especially in battle. Our study today is found under Unit 1, Acts of Courage, and we are at Lesson 1 entitled, Joshua Commands the Son to Stand Still. The lesson is based in the book of Joshua, the 10th chapter, in verses 1 through 15. The question today is, do you believe in miracles? I believe that's a good place to start with this lesson. Do you believe in miracles? Think about that. One of the most disputed elements of the Bible is its many claims of miraculous events. It is becoming more and more commonplace to reject the miraculous because scientific research cannot substantiate it. Christians believe, however, that the Bible is accurate in all that it proclaims. While many today scoff at the Bible, claiming it is anti-intellectual to believe what it says, it is not difficult at all for those who believe God exists and love him with all their hearts. In this week's lesson, we will study a truly miraculous event that occurred in real history. While it is not easily explained or even understood, it should not be considered out of the realm of reality either. God can do all things, and he is not required to provide an explanation to human beings. The title of our lesson again, Joshua Commands the Son to Stand Still. Our aim today, to discuss that there are no circumstances that are too difficult for God to overcome. The life application, what we want to think about during the course of our week in our daily living. To emphasize the importance of praying with confidence believing that God hears us when we pray. The events of this lesson are estimated to have taken place sometime between 1405 B.C. and 1398 B.C. On the timeline here, you'll see highlighted to the left, 1405 B.C. This is post-Egyptian bondage for the children of Israel. So they have been delivered from Egypt already through Moses and the power of God. Um, but this is prior to them having judges and a king. So we're in between that period of time. And Joshua is the leader. And we know Joshua is the leader um, that was after Moses. The biblical events of scripture take place mainly in three continents, which are Europe, Asia, and Africa, which we have circled here in red. And we're concerned today with uh, the portion of Asia that is next to Africa. It is known in modern times as the Middle East uh, region. So this is a, a modern day uh, map of the area as it appears now. Um, you'll see Egypt in green, that's part of Africa, and then you'll see Saudi Arabia in yellow, uh, that is part of Asia. And in between Egypt and Saudi Arabia, you'll see a triangular piece of land, which is circled in red, and that is known as the Middle East region. And that's the uh, focus of our lesson today, and we're going to look at an Old Testament uh, map on the next slide. Uh, you'll see here, this is an Old Testament map of the region of Jerusalem and, and surrounding areas and uh, where Israel is. Um, and the places circled 
uh, here are places that you will hear during the course of our lesson. Um, you'll see uh, AI, which is AI, is circled here. We'll talk about that region. We'll talk about the region of Gilgal, uh, Gibeon, uh, Jerusalem, and you'll see places like Makeda, Azekas, uh, circled and Eglon, Hebron, Lachish. And these are regions where some of the kings were located that we're going to discuss. Israel faced a daunting enemy in the Five Nation Federation led by King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem. So understand this is a time period that we're discussing where Jerusalem was not the capital of Israel yet. Jerusalem had not been conquered by David yet. Uh, so this was well before David captured Jerusalem and made it Israel's capital. In Joshua's time, the Israelites had just entered Canaan in their effort to take possession of the land God had promised them. So King Adonai Zedek is the king of Jerusalem at that time, and there were surrounding areas in the region that had kings themselves. And that's why it indicates five nations federation. These uh, regions came together to form a, a powerhouse. Jerusalem was a pagan city led by a king who did not worship God or respect his people. In a marvelous display of authority over natural forces and events, God delivered Israel and Gibeon, giving them a thorough victory they would not have had on their own. So in this lesson, we're going to discuss the children of Israel and Joshua and their battles. And Gibeon was a region that came under the guise of Israel. It was due to some trickery on Gibeon's part, but they were still under the protection of Israel, and Joshua honored his word in protecting them. So in this lesson, we're going to see that Gibeon was attacked by other kings of the region who feared Israel, and they thought that if they got at Gibeon, it would be a good way to somewhat weaken uh, Israel themselves. But as we're going to see in this lesson, that, that back backfired. Let us begin reading our scriptures. Uh, Joshua, the 10th chapter, the first through the second verse. Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. What we have happening here before we read the next uh, few verses is that the king of Jerusalem saw how God was dealing with the children of Israel and Joshua and how they were conquering lands. And because those lands were so close to um, Jerusalem, the king of Jerusalem now feared what was going to happen to him because he saw other lands being taken over and their, their kings being destroyed. And now you have uh, Gibeon, who we indicated earlier through some trickery, came under the guise of Israel, but the Jerusalem king is now seeing that Gibeon is now protected by Israel, and he's now seeing his position weaken. So this king now is saying to himself, what shall I do? Because now he's fearing what can happen to him. Verses 3 through 5 of chapter 10 indicates wherefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Jephiah, king of Lachish, and unto Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me, and help me, that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. 
Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together, and went up they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon, and made war against it. What we have happening here is the king of Jerusalem, Adonai Zedek, came up with a plan. So he called upon the kings surrounding him in other regions. And so when we talked about like the federation earlier, so he got these kings together, and these were uh, Amorite individuals of Amorite background, because it says the five kings of the Amorites. Um, he got them together of these different locations, and what they decided to do was to attack Gibeon. So they didn't attack uh, Joshua and Israel directly. They went to attack Gibeon, one of the regions, and presumably if they weakened that region, it would help the, to weaken uh, Joshua and the children of Israel. And here, as we indicated earlier, Gibeon had tricked uh, Joshua and the children of Israel in coming under their protection. But here we're going to see how this all plays out, that when Gibeon's attack, is Joshua uh, going to help them? Are the children of Israel going to help them? Or what is going to happen here? When the people of Gibeon heard that God had delivered the Israelites from Egypt and given them victory at Jericho and Ai, they devised a clever scheme that brought them under Israel's protection. So this is what we were talking about earlier. And this is seen in chapter 9 of Joshua, verses 3 through 27. Word spread throughout Canaan about the exploits God had done for Israel the big victories and he had had for them and rival kings had certainly taken notice and especially uh, the king of Jerusalem took notice. Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, knew he could not take Israel on by himself. Instead of attempting to establish peaceful relations with Joshua, however, he decided to build a coalition to fight against the Gibeonites. Now that Israel had control of Ai and Gibeon, they also controlled the central part of Canaan and the major highways of that region. Five Amorite kings came together and laid siege to Gibeon and threatened to overthrow it in order to reestablish their dominance of the region. So you have these kings coming together because they want to have control of the region. They see the surge by Joshua and Israel. So they said, let's attack Gibeon and we can gain control of that. Practical point number one, God reveals himself to a non-believing world through his works on behalf of his people. That is so important. God reveals himself, makes known himself to a non-believing world through his works on behalf of his people. So when we allow God to use us, that is a, a great testimony to the non-believing world of what God can do. Practical point number two, we must learn to trust God when tested by challenges on any and all fronts. We must learn to trust God, believe in God, put our all in him when tested by challenges on any and all fronts. So no matter where the challenge comes, we ought to trust in God, believe in God to bring us through. Joshua, the 10th chapter, the 6th through the 7th verse. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal. And this is where Joshua was with the people, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal 
he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. So Gibeon sent word and said, come help us, please. Joshua and all, please help us. So Joshua ascended, rose up from Gilgal, he and it says the all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. The Gibeonites knew they were outnumbered. They sent messages to Joshua and begged for help. Because they had initiated a treaty with Joshua under false pretenses, remember, refer back to chapter 9, verses 3 through 27. They knew what they did, but they realized this could be payback time. But Joshua was a man of his word and agreed to defend them. So although they did wrong, in that treaty with Joshua to come under their protection, Joshua was a man of his word and agreed to defend them. Our practical point number three, we teach the world about a faithful God as we honor our commitments. There Joshua honored his commitment. Let's remember that we teach the world about a faithful God we teach the world the power of God, what God can do as we honor our commitments. So let's be faithful ourselves to our word. Let's be faithful in what we say, faithful to do what we say we're going to do. And then let God work in our lives to be a testimony to others of his goodness. Joshua, the 10th chapter, the 8th through the 11th verse and the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly, and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel, and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon, and smote them to Ezekiah and unto Makeda. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Haran, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekiah, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. God assured Joshua that he would be with him and Israel, and the Amorite kings would not prevail against them. So when Joshua set upon this journey to defend Gibeon, God assured him that Israel would prevail against these Amorite kings. After marching all night from Gilgal, Joshua reached Gibeon and surprised the Jerusalem-led coalition. God sent the Canaanites into a panic, and Joshua's forces chased them from Gibeon all the way to Ezekiel and to Makeda, covering a distance of 25 to 35 miles. That's a long chase when you talk about covering a distance of 25 to 35 miles. That, that's a long chase. God clearly was in control here. God also sent large hailstones from heaven that killed more Amorite soldiers than the Israelite soldiers killed with the sword. Israel fought, but God secured the victory. So God says sent large hailstones from heaven. Those had to be some large hailstones, a lot of them, and um, heavy in consistency. And it says it killed more Amorites, the scripture says, more Amorite soldiers were killed by these hailstones more than were killed with the Israelite soldier's sword. Israel fought, but God secured the victory. God can use nature other elements to get his job done. He is in total control. Miracles. And here, we, we don't talk about how these hailstones killed Israelite soldiers, but they killed the Amorite soldiers. So just a miracle by God. Practical point number four, as God's children, we have victory through faith in him. 
As God's children, we have victory through faith in him. Call upon the name of the Lord. Believe and trust in God. Believe him for the victory. Joshua, the 10th chapter, the 12th through the 15th verse. These are our last verses for this lesson. And here another miracle takes place. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel, and Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, unto the camp to Gilgal. What a miracle. What a miracle. As the enemy scattered, Joshua knew he needed to annihilate, to wipe out these armies before they could return to their walled cities to ambush the pursuing Israelites at nightfall. So Joshua knew he needed to destroy these armies before they can get back to their cities and and regroup and really uh, go against the Israelites. But to finish the job, to finish the job, Joshua needed more daylight hours. In an act of great faith, he prayed audibly before his men, asking God to let the sun and moon stand still. So he prayed in a way that his men could hear him. So he put himself out there. He made this prayer to God and didn't do it in secret, but he did it outwardly so his men could hear him. He had that much faith and trust in God. Asking God to let the sun and moon stand still, he prayed for something that would help him achieve the revealed will of God, since God had commanded Israel to wipe out the Canaanites. So he wasn't praying for something contrary to God's will, but God wanted them to conquer because he wanted them to have the land, this promised land, the land of Canaan. So he wanted the Canaanites wiped out. So he wasn't praying to accomplish something that was contrary to the will of God. And he did it openly with great faith. He prayed openly to give him more daylight. God answered Joshua's request, giving his army the equivalent of an additional day to win the battle. Getting an additional day. Um... Lengthening the day, that, that's a miracle in itself. Joshua's courage was rooted in his faith in God. He trusted that God was with him. He knew God was all-powerful, even able to overrule the laws of nature. He knew God was able to overrule the laws of nature. The same God who fought for Joshua is with us today giving us grace and courage, unmerited favors, mercy, and courage, bravery. We just need to trust him. Don't don't limit what God can do. Don't put God in your own box, your own mindset, to think that this is all that can happen. But follow the will of God. Go where God wants you to go, where he directs you to go. Follow his will. Do righteous. Do righteousness. Live out righteousness. Don't do things contrary to the will of God. And don't get fearful in times where it looks like, how is this going to happen? How is this going to get accomplished? If God is sending you forward to go ahead and do it, then go ahead and do it. He will make a way. This passage is one of the most challenged accounts in all of the Bible. But Christians should not feel compelled to conjure a natural explanation for a supernatural event. 
don't feel like you have to conjure up or figure out something, uh, make up something to explain the power of God. You can't always put a natural explanation on a supernatural event. That's what makes it supernatural. That's what makes it miraculous. God's power is beyond our human powers. To many critics of the Bible, it is tempting to write off the description of what happened on this day as merely poetic. To do that shows a basic misunderstanding of poetry. Hebrew poetry especially is filled with descriptions that are meant to be taken literally. There may be added symbolism, but that in no way eliminates the underlying reality of what is described. Some people look at this scripture and say that it's just a matter of Hebrew poetry, um, the Hebrew writer, just in a poetic sense, uh, made it seem as if this was talking about the day being elongated um, and the sun stood still. Um, this is all just kind of symbolism, but not uh, to be taken at face value, not literally. But if we are going to believe in miracles and the power of God, then we must give God room to work and not uh, stop God from working and experience his uh, miraculous power. We should be content with trusting that God's word is true even if science cannot explain it. God is sovereign over his creation, and he is certainly powerful enough and within his rights to supernaturally intervene in natural events to accomplish his will. There is no reason for Christians to doubt the validity of this account, as this event was chronicled in at least two different sources, Joshua and the book of Jashar, an ancient writing no longer extant, extant meaning in existence. So there was another writing which is no longer in existence, um, the author here says. Um, it was the book of Jasher that gave this account, as well as this account being in Joshua. After defeating the Amorite armies and delivering the Gibeonites, Joshua returned to Gilgal with his army. The way was now clear for the conquest of southern Canaan, and eventually all the land God had promised to them through both Abraham and Moses. God did a complete job here. Now, I want to touch upon a point that uh, may have entered uh, someone's mind while going through this lesson. You know, it, it, the scripture talks about the, the sun standing still. Now, if we get into um, the science, we, we know that uh, the sun is not rotating, but it's the earth that um, rotates on its axis and revolves around the sun. But the scripture talks about how the sun stood still. So some may be saying, well, wait a minute, the sun isn't the um, aspect it, or, or the part of our solar system that is uh, moving, but it's the earth that is moving because it's revolving around the sun. And you get a day from uh, one rotation of, of the earth. And it revolving around the sun is what gives you your days and years. Um, so you may say, well, the scripture says the sun stood still. So, hey, that doesn't make sense. But just listen to how we talk today. We talk about how the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So we being beings know that it's the earth that is rotating and revolving, but yet we still refer to the sun as rising in the east and setting in the west. So in the same circumstance, when we look at the scripture saying the sun stood still, it's making the point of that the day was elongated. Now, however God did it, either um, causing uh, some shift with the earth not to rotate the same way, or he intervened in nature and did something different. 
we that's where you get into um, not being able to explain a miraculous event with just natural knowledge and looking at the laws of nature because God supersedes all of that. So just know that God is all powerful and God can do what he wants to do. So have faith and trust in him and believe. Practical point number five, prayer is the Christian's most effective weapon in battle. Prayer is the Christian's most effective weapon in battle. So you go into war, you need to pray. I've heard people talk about my war room. That's the, the place in the house they go in to pray, maybe in their closet. Some place they go to close their cells in and to talk to God. So prayer is the Christian's most effective weapon in battle. Practical point number six, God has recorded his past deeds to encourage every believer in times of trouble. We have the word of God here, the miraculous events that have happened in the past, how God has dealt with patriarchs in the past. So God has blessed us by having his past deeds recorded to encourage every believer in times of trouble. So when you're facing treacherous times, uh, you're facing situations that you're not sure how they're going to turn out, just believe and trust in God. Our reflection this week. The enemy that opposes us may seem large and and imposing, but we have guaranteed ultimate victory as we trust the Lord to protect and provide for us. Nothing is impossible for him. So that enemy may seem large and may seem like he, he or she or it can overcome us, imposing, but we have guaranteed ultimately, ultimate victory as we trust the Lord to protect and provide for us. Nothing is impossible for him. Joshua's faith and courage go hand in hand in this passage. His courage was not based on his own strength. Joshua was courageous because he knew that the omnipotent Lord of all was the one who would fight for him and his people. God being all-knowing, God being all-powerful, he, he's the king, ultimate one. He fights for us. And that's how we can have courage. He was courageous enough to give such a massive request in front of all Israel because he had faith that God would do what it would take to give him success against his enemies. Trust God. Do you have that type of courage? Are you one of valor? So you're not just relying on your own strength, but you're trusted in God. And you know that God is all powerful and all knowing. He is the ultimate king. Let's have faith in God. God's faithfulness is not locked up in the past. Believers today can look back upon this miracle and know that they serve a God who comes through on his promises. So this is not just an old story that we just talk about, just to reminisce. Believers today, you today, can look back upon this miracle and know that you serve a God who comes through on his promises. Oh, so awesome. We're thankful today for you joining in with us, joining in on this Sunday School lesson. This is our first lesson of the summer quarter. We are so grateful that you joined us, and we pray that you have received a word of encouragement to help you throughout this week, to help you on your journey, to draw you closer to God and want to know more about God. And we thank you, and we just ask that you join us again. Be prayerful during the week. Until we meet again next week.